completed his residency. Um, he completed his residency in internal medicine here at Stanford and a fellowship at the VA in Palo Alto. But before his medical training, he started his academic life in computer science. And so today he leads a research group with the goal of empowering individuals to deliver better care through the combination of human and artificial intelligence. And I've had the pleasure with working him, with him um, on a couple of projects looking at how AI can improve clinical decision making. And I'm very excited um, to have him share his work with you all today. Um, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll save them for a discussion at the end. Um, over to you, Dr. Chen. All right, fantastic. Let's cue this up. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a discussion on the potential of AI technologies for healthcare. Before we dive in, allow me to introduce myself, although that phrase may take on a surreal meaning today. I'm not the real speaker, nor did the real speaker write this introduction. The voice you're hearing, the image you're seeing on the screen, and even these introductory words were all generated by AI systems. We are actively amidst the arrival of a set of disruptive technologies that are changing the way all of us do our work and live our lives. These profound capabilities and potential applications could reshape healthcare, offering both new opportunities and ethical challenges. To make sure we're still anchored in reality, however, let's welcome the real life version of our speaker. Take it away, Dr. Jonathan Chen, before they start thinking, I'm the one who went to medical school. Wow. Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction. That was weird. I mean, do I actually have to be here, Laura? I mean, I'm pretty sure AI systems just give my presentation for me at this point. I certainly hope and wish AI systems will start answering the overwhelming flood of emails and basket messages I got to keep up with every day. So it's perhaps no wonder that how things are progressing. Right now, we're in the middle of an actively disruptive technology chain with an arms race amongst the biggest tech companies, a feeding frenzy of investors pouring tens of billions of dollars into AI companies, all trying to capture these emerging properties that are surprising many people. Even though I really don't think it's the right question to ask, inevitably, it's going to come up with all of this interest. I mean, who is smarter at this point, humans or computers? What does it even mean to be a doctor or professional when publicly available general purpose chatbots can easily pass a licensing exam better than many humans would. The backlash of reaction to these tools has been not surprising with one educator saying, hang on a second. In fact, many at our own school of medicine immediately said when this technology came out, this technology has to be banned. I mean, what does it mean to give a doctor a medical degree? You want them to know medicine, not how to use a robot. Is it? What, what is it? What do you want from your doctor nowadays or your healthcare system? What does it mean to have quality? let alone education for better or for worse. Uh, people are using these tools for medical advice and counseling, if not to diagnose, treat themselves and then diagnose, treat their dogs. I shared a version of this presentation with some medical house staff um, several months ago, and one of them stopped me midway and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't understand, what are you saying? We are totally using chat GPT and ICU rounds right now. Are you saying we should not be using this as a medical reference? I thought, no, 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 hang on a second. These cool systems, AI systems, it, it, you should not be using this as a reference. Doesn't mean you can't use them, but understand what they are and what they are not. Very grossly oversimplified here, but a lot of these really cool new large language model systems, ChatGPT, BARD, Llama2, MedPalm, in some sense, all they are is autocomplete on steroids, right? You notice how you ever search for something on the internet? I'm searching for coronary artery something, and then autocomplete shows up says, did you want coronary artery disease, coronary artery calcification? How does it do that? How does a computer know what you wanted to say without you even having completed your thought? What it's done is it looks at the last thousands, maybe millions of times somebody searched for coronary artery something, and it just counted up these parameters. 13% of the time, they ended up typing coronary artery disease. 6.5% of the time, they typed coronary artery calcification. Each one of these numbers represents some parameter an underlying model has learned about how different words are often associated with each other. But what if we didn't just look at people's search histories? What if we poured every book ever published, every Wikipedia article, every newspaper article, every Twitter and Reddit conversation, you just poured all of that into a giant large language model to learn how words and sentences are associated. And then don't learn millions of examples. What if you learn 
billions, tens of billions, 170 billion parameters learn about how language interacts with each other in GPT-3, the thing in the first version of ChatGPT. And now GPT-4, Palm 2, the reality is we don't even know. They're not publicly releasing this information. Most guesses are it's over a trillion uh, parameters that they've learned about how all different ways language is interrelated. Then again, who cares? Bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. But what's strange about these systems is a lot of them are demonstrating these emergent properties. It's just autocomplete. Guess the next word in a sentence. What's the big deal? But when you've memorized enough examples and enough parameters about how words are associated, they start to demonstrate very sophisticated seeming capabilities, such as summarization, translation, question answering, generation of ideas, and even a reasoning with a theory of mind. It sure looks like that is what they're doing, which seems crazy and surprising but perhaps it shouldn't be that surprising because what do we as humans, our most prized intellectual and emotional thought, how do we express that, but through the medium of language and words? So if you have a system that is extremely facile and manipulating words, maybe it's not that convincing that it can create a very convincing illusion of intelligence. Let's break down a concrete example. So a clinical example, but you can think about all the different plays it plays into different healthcare and quality settings. Imagine you're a doctor in a clinic and, you know, what does that clinic visit look like right now? Patients here coming in. What are you here for? Uh, you're here for a urinary tract infection? Okay. And then uh, your blood pressure medication has an issue? Uh-huh. Oh, your mom died last week? Oh, oh, so sorry. And uh, which pharmacy did you need to have this sent to? And what's your smoking steps, right? Th this is what your doctor's visit looks like right now because we're so busy trying to keep up with the documentation needs. Wouldn't it be nice if instead you could treat a medical visit just like having a conversation with another human being and a computer just automatically transcribes the conversation as you go? That's not crazy technology, right? That's clearly feasible. A Zoom meeting, you can see PowerPoint's doing it right now as I'm talking in real time. You can caption and transcribe a conversation. Of course, the catch is I can't just upload this transcript with my clinical note. A clinical note documentation has very specific structure and meaning and purpose that it has to fulfill. Although then again, what I mean, what does that mean though? So I, by the time I get home, you know, there's pajama times, 9 p.m., finally fed the kids, put them to bed, and now I'm going to go home and finally do my charting and catch up with all this like this paperwork I have to do to keep our, our work going along. Now I wonder, I wonder, by the way, don't actually do this because of like privacy issues. I wonder what would happen if I copy and pasted this transcript into a chatbot language model and said, can you draft a clinic note based on this? Here's what it come up with. I did not write any of this. This is GPT-4 drafting the clinic note based on that transcript, including the chief complaint, history of present illness, oh, the review of systems, you got to have that accounted, the assessment, even with ICD-10 diagnosis codes. And I double check, these diagnosis codes are correct. Lays out the plan. It tells me what orders I got to enter. Even tells me the billing code to where to go. You know, maybe some edits and additions that are needed here to really make this a usable document for general purposes. But this is a usable clinic note. All right, I've seen real doctor's notes that are not as good as this one. Maybe there's one anecdotal example. You may wonder about the quality of computer bot generated documentation. And this study led by some of our Stanford colleagues, Asher Nyack, Kevin Schulman, and many others put this together. They had a set of patient transcripts, conversations, which were, were simulated, so there's no privacy issues. And then they had some human doctors, our medical senior residents, here's a transcript, write a history of present illness based on that, as if you were documenting into the patient's chart to summarize the key information. And then they asked the computer bot, can you generate a summary uh, transcript, the HPI, based on this transcript. Then they had a separate set of doctors, attendings grade these generated documents of which ones are better in terms of quality, succinctness. And also they just straight up asked, do you think this paragraph was written by a human or written by a computer? And it turns out these physician graders were 61% accurate at telling whether it was a human or a computer. That's pretty darn close to random. Like they could not tell the difference. And I know because I was one of the graders and, and in retrospect, I could realize how I was fooled so many times about what looks so convincing. Let alone drafting, there's also concept extraction. Hey, given this uh, patient's note, can you extract out their medication list and put it into tabular format so that I can actually structure and compute upon it? This used to be you needed a dedicated data science natural language processing team for a job like this. Now, out of the box, you have pretty darn good functionality like this 
with very little incremental effort. Think about all the work you do manually extracting, you know, quality metrics, billing codes, other, you know, key concepts to kind of drive qualitative research tags. All of these things starts to become quite possible to do in automated ways, not perfectly, but you get a quite a lot of functionality just out of the box without a dedicated, used to be a dedicated uh, data science effort. These things are quite good at drafting as well. I mean, let alone different documents. I'll use patient instruction example. Hey, can you draft a set of patient instructions? And I want this written in a fifth grade reading level in plain English. And if not that, how about write it in plain Spanish or plain Mandarin Chinese or plain Russian or plain Swahili or plain Lakota Native American? I'd be mean, like, boom, done, out of the box. Shockingly robust functionality. Think about how there's active studies right now coming out on how much better we could be at informed consent of our patients for procedures by not using such a legalistic language, but translating into a form that allows people to understand it. Why stop at human language, right? These things are actually quite adept, not at just at human language manipulation, but at computer programming language, right? These systems have access to, you know, GitHub, all the open source code on the internet. Computer, can you generate some Python code that converts a medication RX norm ID into a SNOMED code? I, I, I really don't know how to do this off the top of my head. I would have to go study some web pages to figure it out. But here, it just generates that out of the box. And by the way, my obnoxious collaborator keeps using R or C++ or Julia. Can you translate that into a different programming language? Very good at doing so out of the box. However, you also need to be careful and understand the limitations of what we're dealing with. I, I ran this, this thing several times, 10 different times, generated different types of code snippets, and they all run, the syntax is correct, but every single time the code generator was actually wrong. This doesn't actually do what I think it does. Um, it has a misunderstanding of the, the internet protocol and it's fixable, just one or two lines of code, I could fix it. That's a, still a huge boost, but it wasn't quite perfect at, in terms of understanding what it was doing. Even though the syntax looks so perfect, it looks like a real code. The thing is, these symptoms right now are highly prone to the problem of confabulation. The more popular term is hallucination. I don't really like that because hallucination implies somebody who believes something that isn't real. These systems don't believe anything. They don't know. They don't understand. They don't think. What these things do is they're autocomplete on steroids. They stitch together words into a believable sequence, even if there's no underlying meaning. That's, that's the perfect description of confabulation, right? It's like your chatbot had too much alcohol and that has Vernicki Korsakoff syndrome. To make that concrete, I gave this thing some examples. I asked it, hey, who are the three most famous graduates of Stanford Medical School? And it lists some people like, let's see, Paul Berg. Oh yeah, Paul Berg, he's super famous. Right over at LKSC, Berg Hall is named after him where we have our grand rounds. Cause he got a Nobel prize and recombinant DNA. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second, hang on a second. Paul Berg didn't graduate from Stanford Medical School. He didn't graduate from any medical school. He wasn't a doctor. He was a very famous research scientist at Stanford years ago. Look up all three of these people at list. All very real, very famous people. None of them graduated from Stanford Medical School. This system is just making stuff up. The, the, the problem here is not that it's wrong sometimes. The problem is how credible, how fluent and believable it is when it says something wrong. If all you did was look at this answer, how could you possibly know this information was incorrect unless you already knew? And why would you be asking? The most effective lies and misinformation are those that can hide eloquently alongside the truth. How about a real like medical like scenario though? Hey chatbot, could you explain how opioids are good for people with heart failure? And I wanna see references to back it up. The thing does try to hedge and says, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's actually true, but if you say so, okay, this is how opioids are good for patients with heart failure. And here's some references. If you go look up these references, go look up these PubMed IDs, you will find that these articles don't actually exist. It's just stitching together author names and title words together into something that looks like a citation. That is what is optimized. It has no sense of fact, truth, or knowledge. It's, it's just trying to make things that look believable. This is dangerous specifically because how good these systems are at producing incredibly realistic content while sounding credible. We are converging upon a point in history or human versus computer generated content, real versus fabricated information, you can't tell the difference anymore. 
I mean, brief aside, I, I, I really have legitimate fears for the future of democracy in the, in the next couple of years, next 2024, we're going to find out what happens. Like, forget medicine, healthcare. Look at these two videos. Which one do you think is fake? Which one of these videos do you think is fake? It's a trick question. Both of these videos are fake. How are we supposed to maintain a functioning society when we cannot even recognize, let alone agree, on what is real and what is not? I don't know how to solve this problem. I'd be interested in what your perspectives are. We go back to confabulation, though. Imagine you're working with a medical student or a trainee or an intern or a new research assistant, right, who confidently bluffs their way through discussions and rounds, making up information as they go. Patients here for abdominal pain? Hmm. Okay. Have they had any prior surgeries? Uh, yes. They had a cholecystectomy and an appendectomy three years ago. Okay. They got a fever and white count elevator today? Uh, yes, they have a low-grade fever and the white count is 15 today. Mm, interesting. Well, that's making me think, wait, hang on a second. Is all of what that you said just true or are you just making stuff up? Because boy, does it make a difference in terms of how I think about what's going on in the situation. How would you feel if that trainee, that the new RA's answer was, most of what I told you was true? I just can't tell you which parts of it were true. How much would you fear having to work with and rely on this person? How dangerous would they be for patient care and quality? Right? Such an essential new skill that we have to develop, even more so than we already have, is detecting confabulations, you know, your BS detector with another person and now with a computer. I'll briefly allude to just other techniques that are being in use right now. Um, that these things are not just autocomplete and steroids, they're also you can use instruction fine tuning. Here's some examples of what a good human answer is. Try to make your answers more like this. So, so reinforcement learning with human feedback. You notice if you ask the same question to a bot, it generates 10 answers at different times because it's there's just sort of randomness to it. Here, humans, can you grade which one of the answers you like more to try to steer and nudge the system towards things that are quote unquote better aligned with what humans expect? Although that, of course, begs the question, who are the humans that are deciding that what we want to be aligned with? I'll just point to some of the work that's happening right now, right here at Stanford. Uh, Metaline is this data set of hundreds of examples generated by our own doctors. And then the respective section of electronic medical record that answers the question with what the doctor said is the quote unquote correct answer. This gives this great benchmark, this precedent. So all the computer scientists of the world go ahead and tackle, make these systems better at trying to answer questions in a way that a clinical system would actually want. And here's realistic questions clinicians would actually need to have answered versus a lot of engineers, right? They have, they're not doctors. They just don't understand. They don't know what to ask in some sense. So uh, we're giving them the guidance here. You know, think about what are the practical uses, language manipulation, summarization, translation. You should just use these tools right now. Natural language programming. What's the most important programming language? Is it R, Python, C++? It turns out it's, it's English. It turns out English is the most important programming language. We've touched the surface in generating, creating ideas. Do not rely on these systems for knowledge and reasoning, too. Even though GPT-4 and some of these systems are remarkably impressive at simulating having knowledge, reasoning, it, it's an illusion. This is just not what these things are optimized for. It's just very convincing illusion. They will give you misinformation without even realizing it. What's becoming more popular now is retrieval augmented generation. Rather than... Uh, Hey, you know, what's the right way to prescribe morphine? Dude, I mean, chatbot, I don't care what you think the right way to do it is, because I have no idea what random corner of the internet you possibly learned that from. Instead, hey, here's the CDC practice guidelines for opiate prescribing. Can you read, chatbot, can you read this document and tell me what does it say is the right way to prescribe opioids? There, it generates an answer to that. It's basically just quoting a little section out of the out of the document and even telling us what page number it's on so you can re refer to it, right? Trust but verify what you're getting. Let alone imagine a practice kind, maybe it's your hospital protocols, maybe it's an insurance billing diagram, maybe it's some other kind of uh, complex document where you could just read it, but it's hundreds of pages along. Now you've got a tool, use the very powerful natural language capabilities while using an information source that you trust. Don't expect the computer itself to just know what's going on. Not quite ready for prime time, but I'm going to give you a preview of some of the work that's happening right now. What if rather than a PDF document, what if you could give the chatbot and a patient's entire electronic medical record and find out key information, factoids, and abstractions that right now requires extensive manual effort to get? 
right? How often do we have to do manual chart review, look at every clinical load, every imaging report? You might want to ask a question about the patient. Hey, has this patient ever had this disease before or mentioned this symptom? Can you summarize the key factoids about this patient so that they're ready for their next clinic visit or their quality reporting metric or any other of these kind of factors? Like this kind of manual review task is pervasive in any kind of clinical and operational setting which until until two years ago, there was no other way to do it. It was that that was the only thing you could do. It's kind of weird now we can start to experiment. What if instead we had an automated chart abstraction technology? You could feed the patient's medical record into a large language model like GPT-4 or something like this and do document retrieval and ask it questions about the patient chart and automatically read it. Two years ago, this would have seemed impossible and not even worth talking about. Now we're, we're prototyping it right now. Um, many people involved in this, I'm one of the ones trying to help guide one of the prototype efforts, but this takes a whole data science team now, multiple engineers, but also key partners, Rebecca Carey through patient experience, many clinicians, all trying to figure out what is the shape of, you know, someone's going to come into your specialty clinic, for example, We're using ENT as an example, and you could review all that manual information before the visit, so you have a more effective visit, wouldn't it be nice if you could summarize the key questions before they even showed up, and focus your attention on the patient, not just on pulling out information. This is all very preliminary, very prototype stuff. We're actively in the middle of this, but I want to give you guys a sneak preview of what's happening so you can imagine how else you use this in your own work is, um, what do we do? We did a little pilot. We took 50 patients who were going to end up in ENT for nasal congestion, just as an example. And then we had Je Dr. Jennifer Lee. She made up 30 questions she wished she knew about any of these patients before they showed up in her clinic based on guidelines about the kind of factoids you need to know to guide the next treatment plan. And then we had two doctors per case manually review, read the patient's chart and answer each of these questions. And they were binary questions, yes or no. Yes, they were on steroids or no, they're not. Yes, they had nasal drip or they did not. So that way they're verifiable. There is a correct answer you can converge. So when we did this, interesting thing, the computer, in this case, GPT-4, we have a PHI, a privacy safe version of this tied to the hospital. We just give it the patient's chart, feed it all the notes, and then see what it says is the answer to these questions. And it agrees with the physician answer 75% of the time. Definitely not perfect, but again, two years ago, it would have gotten 0%, right? There's nothing that would come even close. The fact that we can attempt this is actually remarkable. What's also interesting is that even though it's only 75% consistent or agreeable now, having two doctors read a chart, we could only get them to agree 83% of the time. A lot of these things, it turns out, are very ambiguous. In medical interpretation. Uh, so the computer is not necessarily that far off. Um, and it. what I was also very worried about is that it would confabulate. It would make up facts about the patient. It doesn't seem to do that too much, which helps a lot. But what it can do is it can get confused. If you mention allergies enough times, it thinks allergy testing was done. It was like, well, technically that wasn't true. If you're asking if the patient had facial pain, it's like, well, the patient one time cut their nose and their nose hurt. The computer said, I guess that's facial pain. Well, I guess that's technically true, but maybe not what the doctor intended with their question. So it, it, it can be confused, but in credible ways, it at least isn't making up facts in the way that I was very worried it will. So, but think about that. What could you do with something that could automatically, but imperfectly abstract and summarize your patient charts right now? I want you further to think about not just where we are, but where we are going. This chart shows over time how well different language model type systems have performed in answering medical questions like you might find in a medical licensing exam. I had medical students or computer science students working on this problem four years ago, 2019, and say, hey, this cool new BERT transformer technology is coming out. Let's just give it a try. Give it some medical board exam questions. I just wonder how it'll do. I've wanted to work on this for decades, but the technology just wasn't ready. They did it, and it was getting maybe 35% accuracy on these multiple choice questions. But, you know, it's better than random, but I mean, it was so low that at the time I was like, eh, I mean, this technology is clearly not usable yet. I mean, this is like a toy problem, fun for a computer science class, completely unusable. I stopped paying attention to this technology for several years until the past year, clearly things started to pop. MedPalm, the first version of Chappie GPT, was basically out of the box, able to just barely pass a medical licensing exam. I had some doctors tell me, well, that's cool, but if you want a doctor who barely passed medical school, you feel free to use this chatbot for help. This thing ain't smarter than me. 
my thought was like, that's not the right way to think about this. A few years ago, this technology was unusable. Now it's like borderline passing. It's not that hard to project where this is going in the not distant future. And indeed, just a matter of months later, GPT-4, MedPalm 2, further systems are coming out that can handily pass a medical licensing exam on its own. Then again, what is this licensing exam? This is like multiple choice questions. That's completely artificial. Nobody's job is, is, is answering multiple choice questions all day, right? We need much more open-ended reasoning and complex you know, thought and reading comprehension. There's no way that multiple choice represents that. So several of my colleagues in medical education, we rapidly threw this study together back in February of last year. Um, we took the actual exams we gave Stanford medical students. Here's a patient vignette. Here's their story. Here's their symptoms. Here's a history. The details here don't matter that much. Just an example, right? It's a big blob of text. And some of it's helpful. Some of it is irrelevant, just like in real life. Patients don't always know what the right history is to give you. And different doctors are looking for different things for different purposes. And then we didn't ask multiple choice. You ask open-ended questions. Summarize the key facts in less than 200 words. Describe a diagnostic schema. Uh, give a prioritized problem list and explain the key factors that motivate your decision. Key thing we have here, which is actually the hardest thing with working with these systems now, is we have a way to grade the answers to these questions because we grade our medical students right now. We have a grading rubric and it identifies how to give them how many points based on what they do. So what happened? Um, GPT 3.5, basically the first version of ChatGPT, like out of the box without any special training, was basically just barely able to pass even these open-ended complex medical reasoning questions. We raced to get this study out in February. It was getting reviewed by a major medical journal. The editor was like excitedly editing it, tweaking the last words. And then March 14th, 2023 rolls around. GPT-4 gets released. The editor emails us back two days later and says, oh, I think your study is now obsolete. Could you please redo the entire thing all over again? Oh. We raced to get this thing out. We were up multiple late nights in two weeks. We cranked this thing out and we were out of date within a month. I give this anecdote really to more accentuate. We are in the middle of a disruptive technology change. The, the pace of movement is, is out of control. It's, it's, it's impossible to keep up with all of it. I won't even have time to just talk about all the newer developments with you know, vision-based multimodal things. And it matters because we did redo the study with GPT-4 and indeed that thing can now handily pass even a complex open-ended uh, reasoning questions. Here again on the right in reddish is GPT-4 and the dark bluish on the right, just FYI, that's how well our own Stanford medical students do on this exam. So they all basically pass the exam to a large degree, but the automated chatbot even outscores our average medical student by a couple points. Then again, no, there's nobody's gonna let a computer practice medicine and I just do something fully automated. It's not really, it's a fun study, but the much more interesting and relevant question, I'll just give you a sneak preview at this point because our studies are ongoing, is what if you give a human a computer? So here we are doing human computer user studies. We had 50 doctors, live human doctors. We gave them some clinical vignettes and we also tested them on like a white male patient versus a black female patient. And they both complain of chest pain and see if there's any variation in how people answer. Do they, should you send them to the emergency room? What medication should you give them? What testing? Those are medical questions, right? But also we said, now that you've answered doctor, here's what a chatbot, a large language model would say to that same scenario. Would you like to change your answer? Because that's an open question. It is not clear. A possible outcome is doctors would totally anchor on their answer and say, I'm not, this computer's not smarter than me. I know what I'm doing. Why would I change my answer? I've already committed. But no, we found people are willing to change their answer. And in doing so, it increased their scores 18% for this particular examination towards getting better evidence-based uh, responses without introducing or exacerbating um, uh, biases in their answers for this particular study. Different studies are showing different findings, but at least in this one, we, we didn't find that. I'll just briefly point to you, this was an interesting study that came out very recently. Uh, Google put this one out. For their MedPalm or one of their versions of their systems, they're trying to do differential diagnosis. Given a patient's story, can you guess what the diagnosis is and how well different systems did? So briefly look at the, um, the goldish, the yellowish line. That's how accurate these things were basically in getting the right diagnosis if a doctor was using this computer to help them. What's very odd about the study is the red line is how well the computer did just by itself without a human. 
I mean, there's a lot of questionable things here and they're not releasing the full information, but clearly the implication they're trying to say by releasing these figures is that the computer by itself was actually better than a human using the computer. And so what does that mean in terms of how you want to design your practice? A, a lot more we can get into because there's more nuance here, but it, it just gets you thinking. Well, let me, before I get to that, I had another, uh, many doctors when we had a panel a year ago or nine months ago say, okay, okay, computers can do many cool things. They can look up information. Of course, they're good at that and they're getting better. But you know what I have? I have the human touch. You can't simulate the kind of empathy and personal connection our patients need that only a doctor can provide them. So this was a fun study that came out many months ago. Um, they had a bunch of medical questions posted on Reddit and real doctors would answer these questions. But they gave these same questions to chatbot to answer. And they had a separate group grade these answers in terms of quality, comprehensiveness, and empathy. And it turns out the bot-generated answers were better in both quality and in empathy. Like the robot was nicer to people than real human doctors were, right? When you got a hundred in-basket message address, I don't have time to write a nice empathetic response. I gotta get a very terse thing just out the door. More examples like that, nuance to the study we can get into. The broader point I wanna make here is obviously I believe there's a huge value to the human touch and connection we can make at a one-to-one -one level. But I don't think we as humans have as much of a monopoly on empathy and therapeutic relationships as we might like to believe. And I fully expect for better and for worse, people are gonna be receiving therapy and counseling through automated bots more than live humans in the not distant future. Not because robots are so great and humans are so bad. No, it's because of an extreme mismatch between the demand, the need, uh, and versus the supply of such support services that in a human-driven healthcare system, we will never keep up with, right? Who here doesn't have enough work to do? We're always overwhelmed. We'll never be able to keep up with, and we're still not seeing as many patients as we really should be. I'll just briefly allude to this one without going to the whole story, but I encourage you to read this um, essay. It's a two-page essay I put out in Stanford Med Magazine recently, where I try to pin down this bot with some challenging ethical dilemmas. I had to counsel me. I have a patient who has dementia and is now aspirating on their food, own food, and the wife is deciding whether or not to put a permanent feeding tube in them. Because that's a very real scenario I actually just had in the hospital, and it was a tough conversation. I wanted to see how the bot would have dealt with a conversation like that. And the summary is, it quite surprised me that the level of sophistication with the kind of responses generated to the point that at first I was trying to mess up the system to show its limitations. By the end, I was like, whoa, this thing I think is starting to provide better counseling than I did in real life. But also why I optimistically think about that, well, it's not computer versus human here. I wonder if we can use a computer system, not just to automate our mundane paperwork. We should definitely do that. Let's do that right now. Nobody wants to do that paperwork. But also, could I use this computer to better improve my own human interpersonal skills, right, by allowing me to practice high stakes conversations in a low stakes environment? I'm going to wrap here just so we have more space for discussion. Again, this whole story, this whole thread is, is in that essay. Um, I encourage you to read it. It's a, it can be an entertaining read. As we consider where we are in the hype cycle for emerging technology, right, X axis time, Y axis is hype, how excited people are. Notice that where we are right now, just cresting over the peak of inflated expectations, generative AI, foundation models are other words for these types of systems, chat GPT and large language models. I'm glad to have these conversations we can hear so that we can better appreciate the capabilities, the limitations, and the implications of such emerging technologies so it can soften an inevitable crash into the trophic disillusionment where people are like, whoa, confabulations, bias, workflow, tech consolidation, imbalance of power, right? All privacy issues, all these things have to be addressed so that we can quickly move on to the slope of enlightenment. Well, we're kind of already doing that with more classical clinical prediction models. We have a whole process now for that and, and find ways to use every information data source to best improve our collective health together. All right, thank you, everybody. I'm gonna wrap there and then uh, happy to open up discussion. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm sure everybody would enjoy me with uh, join me with a uh, virtual round of applause. Um, that was a really great presentation. Um, I'm glad you ended with the uh, Gartner hype cycle because I was thinking about that um, as you were talking, and I I often feel like I'm in my own trough of disillusionment all the time with AI. But um, I feel like your presentation really took us 
um, through the cycles. And so um, I want to ask the first question, which is really if, if we're starting to move more towards um, more routine use, as your ICU resident said that, you know, they're already using chat GPT. Um, I guess my question is related really to what you talked about, the need to kind of train doctors in how to interact with it. There's training that's needed on that end. Um, are our providers, our clinicians, getting that preparation? Because if it's going to become commonly used, you know, how well are the people who are going to be using it prepared to use uh, the power of chat GPT? <laughs> I, I didn't even get into like full education, right? It's like, even if you don't want to use this stuff, realize like 90% of your students are already using this, including to just do their homework and turn in tests without even attempting to edit the content. You know, it may, it may very well be the younger generation figures that out before, you know, we can keep up. We don't have any formal education curriculum around this or training. It's people are just hacking this together, which is like cool and exciting and democratizing innovation, but also very predictable harms are going to happen along that way. Um, you know, Eric Strong is leading a task force trying to bring like medical education working groups and to have a formalized way to, hey, if you're going to use this stuff, understand what they are, what they're not. That's what I'm trying to do in this talk, right? It is cool, realize limitations, and then you can use it and know what you're getting into. Completely not standardized. And there's a lot of inertia to move that. Um, people are like, well, what's going to leave the education curriculum if you want to fit this in? And um, and others at the extreme end is like, this stuff should not be allowed in the medical school at all. It's so dangerous. And so counter to how we do education. I think that's kind of a hopeless uh, precedent, but very interested in what others here think about how we can and should train a, and retrain a generation of, of healthcare workforce. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely hear concern that the guardrails aren't there for uh, for your fast car um, right now. Um, I, there's some questions in the chat. Um, it looks like somebody's raised their hand. So why don't we go with um, the raised hand first? Is that Mohana? Yeah, hi. Uh, hey, Jonathan, Mohana uh, calling in from oncology. Um, one thing that I think is um, perhaps maybe even lower, maybe too low of a task to ask AI is so much of care delivery. Um, so, you know, we we think about, uh, of course, these kind of bigger, can you come up with a differential diagnosis? And obviously that's very impressive. Um, I would love it if my patient has a CT scan before they see me mm -hmm. and not a day after. Um, and, you know, has uh, in oncology, again, totally biased come from my uh, perspective, but like, I call it uh, Tetris, where we are basically trying to walk someone through the most stressful time of their life mm -hmm. and also say that you need a, so do the CT, but then do the biopsy, but then like, don't do the PET too soon because we'll need to review that and like that. So I'm just curious in your expertise, is this being used in some of the more grunt work in medicine, which I think ca honestly catches us more in a loop than sometimes the medical thought itself? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For what it's worth, like differential diagnosis is a very classic medical AI, like science problem to work on in the 1980s, even though in like real medical life, how often is differential diagnosis the thing you're struggling with? You know, there's some 5% of the cases where that matters. 90% is like, I'm just trying to execute care. I know what's going on. I'm trying to get the patient what they need is where we went into most of our work. I would say these language models, eh, they might help with some documentation. Maybe they'll help you with your insurance authorization or something like that. But this kind of coordination of care, patient experience is very much a thing I'm interested in. And we've talked to, you know, Tip Kim's team as well. They're just like, it's all about access, getting our patients what they need. And when they arrive, stuff that actually is working when the way they needed it to. I think this combines different technologies, it's not the language models. Those are cool too, adjuncts, but there's a lot of, I've worked on like recommender algorithms for years. Hey, if you're gonna go to that oncology clinic, the last thousand times they needed a CT scan and they needed these four blood tests before they even show up. If you show up there without that, you're gonna waste that visit and it delays both your care and the next patient's care. And these are predictable things. So a lot of this stuff I think comes in, you know, at this point, AI is a marketing buzzword. That's what it is, right? I mean, a computer, you just call it AI now, right? Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity for computational and information methods um, to support that. Whether you call them AI or not, I would say maybe it's a separate factor, but I, I'm very interested. Really, I'm interested in like electronic consult, digital specialty consultation, exactly to enable access for our patients without needing, right? It's not necessarily a medical judgment problem. It's just coordinating all this predictable stuff in an effective way, but great idea. Thank you. Uh, looks like Michael Rothman had both a question in the chat, but also has his uh, hand raised. Uh, Michael, would you like to ask your question? 
Sure. Uh, questions sort of the same as I put in chat. I mean, it's great to do these tests and predictive models of predicting the, the correct answer or the test answer. But a lot of things are about, you know, with humans, about being humble and being curious. And how, how much could these models help us with seeing where there's uncertainty around an answer and being humble about that uh, rather than giving the best answer? Because maybe that's the space that can help the most. People good, you know, can be good at saying, when do I need to ask a colleague for help? When is something uncertain, like the last question, and I need to maybe prioritize certain tests to reduce the uncertainty? Uh, how good is it in that space of helping us see variability and guide us towards uh, the best actions to reduce that uncertainty? I, I would say it's active area reaching development right now. Remember I talked briefly about that like medical alignment. The reality is if you just let loose this kind of thing, it's just gonna spew out text that it's reciting from somewhere off the internet. And that could be good sometimes and not so good other times. And it is scary when it sounds very confident when it gives you wrong information. Some of these systems, because they're aware about these like uh, safety issues are trying to steer like, whoa, 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 be very careful with any of this on the medical advice and be cautious in interpretation about what you're confident or not on. So there are ways to steer in that direction, but just like with a real human doctor or a real human medical student, right? They can be have false confidence as well. Um, and and for what it's worth, actually, Russ Alban he phrases very nicely in a way. You know, somebody says, "Well, these things are just very good at giving you average responses, but that's not very creative. That's not very innovative." In medicine, we kind of want very average, very standard responses. You don't want that much variability. You want someone to be appropriately hesitant. And if it's a little bit off sometimes, but it tells you that it's a little bit unsure, like that's okay. Cause we deal with medical trainees or all the time, right? We're, we're used to being needing to double check some stuff. But uh, so qualitatively it can do these kinds of things. Systematically study them is, is very difficult whether it's doing it in a way that you would deem valid or not. I, I mean, maybe you, you can respond back. Um, Assuming you had all the budget in the world, you could hire all the people in the world, how would you decide whether or not a computer is doing a good or job bad of that? It's actually not trivial to even design that evaluation. And a lot of the current research is just how do you evaluate the outputs of a language model is actually very difficult. Yeah, great question. Um, it looks like Alan has his hand raised. Alan, would you like to um, ask your question? Sure, excellent, excellent presentation. I didn't realize the extensiveness of AI. Um, I'm. I'm a uh, nurse in quality. And when I was at the bedside, I could walk into a patient's room and there'd be a lot of visual cues that would indicate what my next step would be in terms of um, diagnostics or assessment or what kind of plan I'd make for the patient without even talking with the patient. And I'm curious to know, I, kn I know that you mentioned a lot of these were vignettes. Is there anything that you looked at in terms of visual um, clues for the AI? Sure, I would say this is a lot less far along than the text-based, and I'll tell you a little bit why. You know, when you do that user study and we had like the white male chest pain versus the black female chest pain, prior studies have shown, if you just say the patient is a white male and they have chest pain or they're black, uh, people are not even gonna notice basically. They have to see, there was a video of an actor portraying it and that's more likely to evoke somebody's uh, subconscious reaction, good or bad in that way. Um, I think why the language stuff is going so advanced so far is because like you can download the entire internet basically. It's basically what these companies have done. And there's just so much text there that you can learn from. Every textbook, every PubMed article, right? Um, do we have, I think you're absolutely right, a good nurse, good doctor, you just go in and just look at a patient. That's the, that's one of the key skills we're like, whoa, uh, this patient is sick. I don't even know what's going on yet, but we need to like do something. You, you, just, you have this intuition when you just spot them. This patient's not... Like the doctor, right? This patient is not going to withstand a chemotherapy. I haven't even done a test. I can just tell by looking at them, right? Um, the problem is, where's the record of that, those videos, those images? Yeah, there's probably snapshots you can get, but you're dealing with thousands, maybe tens of thousands of examples at best versus text. You have literally like you know, petabytes of data on the internet you can download. So I think that's a way this multimodal text and video and audio and images systems that can integrate all of that. Um, much less robust, but I think is a natural progression we'll see over time. I, I would say, though, it, it's going to take a little bit longer to get there. 
All right, I think we have time for two more questions. So let's go, um, there's one in the chat and then we'll come back to the last hand that's raised. Um, I think it's a question from Daniel Collins. It seems to be about, about um, feasibility at Stanford. So do you conceive of a way to wall off some models for cybersecurity, for example, using Stanford's Alpaca 7B on a local server? Otherwise, have there been any assuring steps to allow an AI access to PHI while remaining within PHI security requirements to begin using um, AI uh, large language mo models for internal administrative backlogs. So, so two two things we can do. You definitely can. You got the Alpaca. We we're playing with Llama too, and other of these like open source language models. You can start up your own server. You can do whatever you want with it, right? Um, if you want PHI, well, then you better do it in a secure research computing facility, which we have. But um, what? Also, we have through the hospital, not for research, but through quality operational means, uh, the data science team is uh, administering this. We, we have GPT board, essentially chat GPT plus. We also have MedPalm 2 and others where it is completely safe to use PHI. We're sending real patient records to it because that one has been secure. There's a business association agreement in place. Um, we can't use that for any arbitrary research for any operational purpose like this ENT nasal congestion intake thing. We're using real patient records and building prototypes. Um, I, I'm a little bit premature because it's still being prototyped right now, but we're trying to make a chat-like interface that some people are familiar with, but that allows you to just talk to patient in electronic medical records real time right now. The prototype already exists. We just haven't disseminated it yet because it, it's, it's, it needs to be polished up a little bit. And then I, I, what I'm trying to push toward, which others, you know, it's like, do you want control or do you want, you know, dissemination? Some are like, well, we better be very careful who we let touch that thing because maybe they'll mess something up or do something bad. I think why ChatGPT was such a big deal, 100 million people in two months, is because anybody could use it and understand it very quickly, rather than a data science team, a quality group, controlling what's the right way to do stuff. I bet if you all had this tool in your hands right now and could safely use it with your patient records, you would invent 20 better ideas than I could within six months, right? Because I don't have time to do all of them. Our whole team does it. So I'm trying to nudge it in that direction, but you can imagine it's uh, some sensitivity about control versus dissemination and the right way to do this, right? I don't know, Laura, how fast you want your car to go without guardrails? I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm in that trough of illusion, disillusionment. So like, <laughs> let's slow down a little bit. Um, I think we have, um, we have, I think there's some more questions in the chat, but um, just to be respectful of everybody's um, time, let's have one more question. And then um, if Dr. Chen can stick around to answer any more up until uh, one, that would be great. Um, I I'm not sure what your name is, but your hand's raised. Would you like to ask your question? It's Daniel Cap. Yes, a very exciting presentation. Uh, I think what's missing is, is not a comparison of 83%, but 62%, but the significance of the errors. I think you have to start seriously taking that into account. If I make an error that has very little consequence, it has little consequence. But if I make a major error, even if it's 1%, that can cause a patient's life. So I, I, I see that missing from all the evaluations. You have to not just look at right or wrong answers, but the consequences of the wrong answer. Excellent point, excellent point. It, this is like simple preliminary assessments like, hey, you know what? If they got the dosing wrong and it was two weeks ago, not two and a half weeks ago, you know what? It's, it's fine medically. It's not really making a difference, but if you said the patient was on steroids versus they're not, like that, that really makes a difference in terms of what you interpret. Um, so excellent point. Some of the other, it really becomes more of a qualitative rather than a quantitative evaluation. And there are those approaches like, doctor, can you just score of one to five? How safe was this answer to give some range of those? And there's these kinds of approaches as well. Challenge being, it's not easy to get even two doctors to agree on what the correct score is in those cases, but you can't ignore it either. So great point, Dr. Cap. For what it's worth, I know we're at time, but I'm also happy to engage with anybody afterwards. Um, this is an ongoing thread of work that there are many people on campus and beyond that are trying to figure this out. And you all know it in ways better than any of us could. So we're happy to partner together. Thank you very much. I just want to say thanks again, um, Dr. Chen, for presenting today with a really excellent presentation. Uh, so another round of applause. But if you can stick on for a couple more minutes, there's still more questions coming in. <laughs> Um, I think uh, there's one from Ann Mitchell, which I'm not entirely sure. Will the AI eventually get smart enough to patient identify the information being sent? I'm not um, not entirely sure. Um, 
but I wonder if there's something around like patients interacting with um, chat GPT. Identify the information so that you could identify who's being sent. I would say a lot of it is is possible. You know, that's why the broader point I try to say is, you know, don't think about where we are, but where we're going. Two years ago, we wouldn't be talking about this at all. We'd be talking about like clinical risk prediction models or something like this and maybe recommender algorithms. Now it's like, holy smokes, a lot of this is moving. I, I, I really do think this is like the internet being invented. Um, there was a way you lived before the internet and afterwards. And if you went, I don't, some of you, I, I was 13 years old at the time, but if you can remember what it was like before the internet, um, it would look like science fiction, the things you take for granted on a daily basis right now to somebody from you know 40 years ago. Um, I, I think just like knowledge and memorization of facts used to be a valuable skill. You could be on Jeopardy if you could do that, right? Now, like, who cares? You just pull out your smartphone, you look up the fact like instantaneously. In that similar way, like language and manipulation, drafting and reading comprehension, I think suddenly the value of those skills is very different in just the next couple of years than it was um, two years ago. So whether it can do it right now, um, I think it'll just keep on advancing and it may surprise us how that changes our lives. By the way, I don't think that means robots take over the world, right? After the internet, there's still we still all have jobs, but the nature of our jobs, the kind of work we do, the kind of tasks and skills that we prioritize can shift. Yeah, great. I think that there's another um, interesting question in the chat, which seems to be about, um, uh, around, around uh, predicting breast cancer. So um, what are your thoughts on implementing AI to predict things that humans typically would not be able to predict in medicine? For instance, training with images from breast cancer screenings of patients with seemingly healthy breasts that eventually develop breast cancer versus ones that don't. Um, doctors would normally classify normal or not normal, but if AI can eventually predict cancer development with those features um, that it picks up itself, what are your thoughts on uh, the future of that? Certainly feasible, right? Computer-aided diagnosis, that's been a whole category of efforts for years. And now the imaging-based ones are, that was kind of the hype wave, you know, five, six years ago. And now they're starting to mature more. There was a little bit too much hype. And who is it? Jeffrey had said, it's clear that all radiologists should fire, be fired and never like, no, not another radiologist ever be trained again. And it's like, like yeah, that's a little too extreme. And I, I think that's been worn out. Um, their tasks may change, but uh, th th that was clearly an overstatement. But using these tools to support that automated pathology screening, HPV screens, like, oh, it's actually really hard for a human to, to read a negative image over and over again. Eventually, you just lose pay. You can't pay attention anymore. So having a computer as a level of, level of screening and anticipating or spotting things that human eyes don't perceive that well, clearly possible. But whether you have enough data to do so is often a limitation. And if it is fundamentally a rare event, it's like it doesn't matter what technology you use. It's just very hard to predict and screen for rare events uh, because they are they are rare, um, and you're more likely to have a lot more false positives. So I ex totally expect these computers are going to be a lot more in all of our workflows. Um, I don't think that it. I don't think it's you know a panacea that resolves fundamental issues that have nothing to do with computers. It's just like it's just a hard problem. Yeah, I guess um, as well, part of the question is um, in, in much the way that uh, like Google predicts what you're going to continue typing, could it predict how an image that that tissue mm -hmm. might change? Totally, totally. This generative uh, it, it, product, right? You can go on Dolly 3 and these things, you generate images right now. But I think that's a natural thing that um, Eric Horvitz, Matt Lundgren, they were calling it the history of future illness. Here's the patient's chart so far. Here's their breast cancer or breast image so far. What could it look like next year? What could it look like tomorrow? And show me the five different variations it's most likely to look like. And then you can start to play out these what if scenarios and game of, well, hmm, this is what might happen to my patient in different ways and the relative chance it could. And, and in theory, we, we kind of already do that in our heads, but having a formalized way to do that and play with it and interact with it, it really does change our experience. I've, I've used chat tools to do differential diagnosis for patients like, pretend if my patient did do this, what would have happened? And it gets it stimulates your own thinking in a way that's different than just here's the answer. Yeah, interesting. I just was thinking about that. If you could predict somebody's future likelihood to get disease, I guess we have that with a little bit of genetics now. Mm -hmm. But like, what do you do with that information? Yep. Um, which then becomes the challenge of, of implementing it. Um, right, we're almost at one o'clock. I think, um, I don't know if there's any more questions that came in. David um, Larson want to get the final yeah. comment? It looks like he, I know, he I had to. Yeah, they responded to Jeffrey Hinton here. 
You know, I don't know about the final comment. This is a fascinating thing so much, Jonathan. Um, maybe I'll just say, you know, it's interesting, you know, in radiology, of course, we are in the crosshairs of, you know, are we going to be replaced? I, I'm I'm seeing the opposite. I'm seeing actually it creates more opportunity um, and more things to do. Uh, there's greater quantitation. You know, there's greater, you know, there, there's their need for greater imaging because there is more care management uh, uh, pathways and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of exhausted. I'm waiting for the AI to help out, but I think actually what will happen is it, the the demand is going to be greater than yeah. the uh, supply that will increase that productivity, and so we're going to be well in business. I think this is like you said earlier. You know, uh, we all have plenty to do, so it's more about you know how do we capitalize on this technology to you know to do what helps us do great work and helps our patients. Fantastic, great theme, and I, I saw the SMI this theme of uh you know people are the most important scarce resource, and that's definitely a consistent theme. I would say I wish a computer would do my job for me. I wish it would automate me to obsolescence because I have way too many patients. How many wait six month waiting lists our patients are on to be seen? And there will still be plenty more to do. That um, for one thing, you can't replace a doctor or a human with a computer, and and if you could, I that would be very helpful. Um, we got plenty more great things, and let's use these tools to deliver the care we want to. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for all your work and thanks for presenting this. This is fantastic. Thanks, David. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen, and thank you all for joining us today. Have a good Have one. Have a great day, everybody. Happy to connect afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.